100 enthusiasts could have had access to seeds or plants. And those could have changed hands between friends or been bought by mail order from anywhere in Europe, anywhere in the Antipodes. But it was only one in the series of mystifying flowers that each year arrived by post on the first day of November. They were always beautiful and for the most part rare flowers, always pressed, mounted on watercolour paper in a simple frame measuring 6 inches by 11 inches. The strange story of the flowers had never been reported in the press. Only a very few people knew of it. Thirty years ago, the regular arrival of the flower was the object of much scrutiny at the National Forensic Laboratory, among fingerprint experts, graphologists, criminal investigators, and one or two relatives and friends of the recipient. Now the actors in the drama were but three. The elderly birthday boy, the retired police detective, and the person who had posted the flower. The first two at least had reached such an age that the group of interested parties would soon be further diminished. The policeman was a hardened veteran. He would never forget his first case in which he had had to take into custody a violent and appallingly drunk worker at an electrical substation before he caused others harm. During his career he had brought in poachers, wife beaters, con men, car thieves and drunk drivers. He had dealt with burglars, drug dealers, rapists, and one deranged bomber. He had been involved in nine murder or manslaughter cases. In five of these, the murderer had called the police himself and, full of remorse, confessed to having killed his wife or brother or some other relative. Two others were solved within a few days. Another required the assistance of the National Criminal Police and took two years. The ninth case was solved to the police's satisfaction, which is to say that they knew who the murderer was, but because the evidence was so insubstantial, the public prosecutor decided not to proceed with the case. To the detective superintendent's dismay, the statute of limitations eventually put an end to the matter. But all in all, he could look back on an impressive career. He was anything but pleased. For the detective, the case of the pressed flowers had been nagging at him for years. His last unsolved and frustrating case. The situation was doubly absurd because after spending literally thousands of hours brooding on duty and off, he could not say beyond doubt that a crime had indeed been committed. The two men knew that whoever had mounted the flowers would have worn gloves. That there would be no fingerprints on the frame or the glass. The frame could have been bought in camera shops or stationery stores the world over. There was, quite simply, no lead to follow. Most often the parcel was posted in Stockholm, but three times from London, twice from Paris, twice from Copenhagen, once from Madrid, once from Bonn, and once from Pensacola, Florida. The detective superintendent had had to look it up in an atlas. After putting down the telephone, the 82-year-old birthday boy sat for a long time looking at the pretty but meaningless flower whose name he did not yet know. Then he looked up at the wall above his desk. There hung 43 pressed flowers in their frame. Four rows of ten, and one at the bottom with four. In the top row, one was missing from the ninth slot. Desert Snow would be number 44. Without warning, he began to weep. He surprised himself with this sudden burst of emotion after almost 40 years. Part 1. Incentive. December 20th to January 3rd. 18% of the women in Sweden have at one time been threatened by a man. Chapter 1. Friday, December 20th. The trial was irretrievably over. Everything that could be said had been said. But he had never doubted that he would lose. The written verdict was handed down at 10 on Friday morning. And all that remained was a summing up from the reporters waiting in the corridor outside the district court. Carl Mikhail Blomqvist saw them through the doorway and slowed his step. He had no wish to discuss the verdict, but questions were unavoidable, and he, of all people, knew that they had to be asked 
and answered. This is how it is to be a criminal, he thought, on the other side of the microphone. He straightened up and tried to...